Good evening, everyone. Welcome to all of our viewers on YouTube and Facebook. My name is Bob Abbey. I'm an adult services librarian for the city of Forest Grove, and you are uh, here tonight for our first live stream program of 2022. Uh, our guest this evening is Victoria Sundell, who is the um, head of integrative learning at the Five Oaks Museum. And she's gonna be talking about their exhibit, This is Kalapuyan Land. Uh, she has a presentation and she's got some uh, artifacts and, and uh, uh, objects that she's gonna be sharing with us. Um, before I bring Victoria into the stream, I just wanna talk a little bit about a couple of our upcoming programs in February. On February 8th, uh, we're welcoming Tyler Stewart. Tyler is the uh, founder and executive director of the Oregon Remembrance Project. And his uh, talk is, how do you reconcile a lynching? Uh, Tyler has done a lot of work around the story of Alonzo Tucker, who was a African-American gym owner and boxer who was lynched in Coos Bay in 1902. And uh, he's going to be talking about uh, the work he's done with the Oregon uh, Remembrance Project and also um, his personal journey to uh, realizing reconciliation as a part of uh, social justice and racial healing. And then uh, the following week, on February 15th, uh, we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Donna Sinclair, who is a Northwest historian and author, uh, co-author of a book called Black Woman in Green, Gloria Brown and the Unmarked Trail to Forest Service Leadership. Uh, Dr. Sinclair is gonna talk to us about uh, Gloria Brown, fascinating story. Uh, she moved through the ranks of the Forest Service starting as a transcriptionist in Washington, DC, and she eventually uh, became a forest supervisor. She was the first African-American woman to uh, hold that position. Uh, she eventually transferred to Montana and then uh, uh, moved to uh, the Northwest. And she was the uh, lead for the Sioux Law National Forest in Oregon and also the Los Padres National Forest in California. So those two programs as part of Black History Month in February. As always, you can uh, watch here on YouTube. The best place to find out about any of our programs is by following us on Facebook. And our Facebook address is right there. Or if you want, you can also visit the library's website and the address is right there. <laughs> and um, I'll post those links in the comment section tonight. So uh, you can uh, get a hold of those. These programs are very interactive, and I do encourage you, if you have questions or comments at any point tonight, to post them in the comment section, either on Facebook or on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, you have to have a YouTube account to interact with us. But if you're on Facebook, you can just pop those in the comment section, and they'll show up, and uh, we can get to those at the end, or you can save them to the end too. That's totally fine. So I'm gonna bring Victoria in. Hi, Victoria, good evening. Hi, Bob, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm well, really you. excited to be here with everyone tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are very excited about uh, this program with Five Oaks, and also um, we can maybe, um, uh, sort of spoil the lead a little bit and say that we're also talking about doing some uh, collaboration throughout the year. So this is the first of um, what I think will be some really great programs with Five Oaks. We're really happy to have you with us tonight. And um, I'm gonna step out of the stream and I will leave uh, this to you. So if you wanna go ahead and get your slides ready, um, I can make sure to get those in the stream. All right. All right. Welcome to our This is Calipuyan Lands presentation. 
Uh, my name is Victoria Sundell, and I am the head of integrated learning at Five Oaks Museum. Five Oaks Museum is located in Washington County on the PCC Rock Creek campus. We have an over 65 year history. We originated as a collection of settler belongings as descendants of pioneers wanted to preserve um, their belongings and their stories for future generations. And we care for over 100,000 cultural resources from uh, Washington County, from indigenous belongings to photographs and manuscripts and historic records. Um, in the last two years, we have rebranded as Five Oaks Museum, originally Washington County Museum, um, in order to better represent and approach the complex and layered history of this area. Um, our most recent exhibition on our website is hashtag StandUpFG, um, Latinx Youth Activism in the Willamette Valley. And since that's a Forest Grove centric exhibition, I would highly recommend you check that out later. But today we'll focus on this is Californian land. A little bit about me. Um, I am, as I said, the head of integrated learning. So I teach a lot of our education programs at the museum and that sort of thing. Something to note is that I am not indigenous. So because of this, that will change the perspective a bit that you hear this presentation from. For example, uh, when I'm talking about Kalapuyan folks, I will be saying they did this as opposed to someone who's Kalapuyan might say, we do this. So just keep that in mind. All right, getting into this is Kalapuyan land. This exhibition began in 2019. It was curated by Steph Littlebird Vogel, who's a Kalapuyan and member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. And she actually grew up in Banks, Oregon. Um, it's now an online exhibition and we also uh, bring it out into the community with yard signs. So we'll be focusing on this exhibition today. And what's really special about this exhibition is that Steph took these old text panels, they're sepia toned, pretty large, um, that the museum had made around 15 years ago about her tribe, the Kalapuya. And she actually annotated and she wrote right on the panels. You can see here, she's uh, taped over some words and written on top of it and she's added more writing in to bring a Kalapuyan perspective to Kalapuyan tribal history rather than um, solely the settler perspective. And this, you know, really points out the changes that she's made and how indigenous representation uh, is addressed in museums. Now I have a quote from Steph about her thinking behind the exhibition. And I'm not sure if this sound will work. So let me try it. And then if it doesn't work, you can let me know and I will um, just read the quote to you. Thank you, Bob, for letting me know uh, in the chat that the sound is not working. And that's all right, it happens sometimes. So I will read this quote to you from the interview with Steph Littleberg Vogel. She is saying, when the museum invited her to look at the exhibition in its untouched version, the first thing that she noticed was the title. And as a writer, the language is really important to her. So she thinks that the subtlety of words can 
create a sort of mythology in a way. So when we say this Kalapuya land, there's a sort of disembodiment, like what does that mean? Whereas when she inserts is into the title, which was the very first change that she made, she's saying it is currently our land and it has been our land. And then it's also a land acknowledgement built into the title as well. You know, land acknowledgement being a formal recognition uh, of the indigenous caretakers of a particular land. And then she also goes on to say later in this interview that for her, when she's looking at these panels, she sees her family, she sees her family history. She sees the things that have happened, not only to her family, but to the people in her community and continue to. So she's actually saying that it's important to emphasize that, yeah, these things happened in the past, but they continue to influence our daily life uh, in many ways. So the first change, as she we mentioned, was she changed the title uh, and added the word is to this is Kalapuyan land. Next thing she did was come to this set of map panels and you can see that she has added um, turquoise embellishments and she has mm -hmm. also uh, crossed out some of the words here. So let's look a little closer at that. Here you can see uh, where Kalapuyan land is. This is actually a map, um, as you can see, tribes and languages um, of the language groups. So Kalapuya is a language group um, that tribes and bands throughout the Willamette Valley spoke dialects of. And in the Tualatin Valley, the Tualatin Kalapuyans spoke the dialect of Tualatin Kalapuya. Further south, you get Yamal Kalapuya, Santiam Kalapuya, and so on. So in this orange area, that's where we can see this is the Willamette Valley where the Kalapuyan tribes uh, land is. And here we have the Tualatin Valley. And then Clackamas Chinook, um, this is where you can see the Portland metro area. And then you can also see here on this panel that Steph has crossed out um, two of the words in the original title of the map so that it now reads tribes and languages of the Oregon country. One, we may be familiar with um, the preferred terminology for native folks is we typically refer to native folks as native if we're using the umbrella term, but really the best way to refer to any person with native identity is with their tribal affiliation. So saying, you know, Steph is Kalapuyan or someone else is from some other tribe. And then she's also pointing out that, you know, this isn't old, native people are still here. This is still native land. And then she's also underlined um, the Kalapuyan name for the Willamette River. So the other thing that Steph did was she curated contemporary art by indigenous artists living in the Portland area today into the exhibition. And she really wanted to show the aliveness and the diversity uh, in contemporary indigenous folks in the community uh, here today. So typically I ask the audience to join in some art analysis with me, but since you all are here on the live stream, I will sort of guide us through it. And this is one of the first artworks that you'd, you would have seen if you walked into the exhibition. And when I like to, when I look at art, I like to start with noticing everything that I see. So before I even think about what does it mean, I take a moment and I say, okay, what do I just literally see here? I see a yellow splash of color. I see black swirling lines. They're in layers. You can see white between the black lines. Some of them are jagged. Some of them intersect with each other. I also see where the yellow splash um, is sort of laid on top of these black lines. It looks like the black lines maybe were carefully made first and then the yellow was splashed on top, you know, in just a moment. And where the yellow overlaps with the black lines, it almost looks 
like it's a little bit green or there's a little bit of some color mixing happening there. So after I've taken a moment to look at everything in the artwork, then I think about, OK, what might the artist be trying to communicate here? When I see the title of the artwork, The Sun Bathed Everything, I wonder if that means the yellow represents the sun. I also, I wonder if there's something about time here because the yellow was just splashed on in a moment in contrast to um, the black. Now that I'm thinking about it, the black actually reminds me of tree rings, which we know represent how old a tree is. And so I wonder if there's something there. It could also be like layers of earth. So I could be, I could imagine like the sun, you know, bathing over the trees, giving them life, giving them green, um, or the sun, same thing goes for the earth. So after I've thought about what the art might represent, then I like to read a quote from the artist, you know, make sure I get their own voice in there. And this is a paraphrase of a quote from Angelica. She's saying that there's a word in the Lakota language that's special to her. I should point out that Angelica is Oglala Lakota. Um, she's not Kalapuyan as the contemporary indigenous community in the Portland area is very diverse and comes from tribes from all over um, Turtle Island. So Angelica is saying that the word layeska means an interpreter between two worlds. Sometimes layeska translates between the spiritual world and the human world, or layeska can communicate between the Lakota world and the settler world. Art can be a type of layeska. That's really interesting to me when I hear the word Laeska and hear that it's an interpreter between two things because I'm seeing these two types of marks intersect and overlap. Um, and I don't know, almost maybe communicate with each other in this artwork. That's really interesting. I think that maybe she's making a connection of land to language here which is also interesting because it's making me think back to how Steph underlined the Kalapuyan origin of the name of the Willamette River. I'm thinking that's, you know, indigenous language that's part of the land today and has been part of the land for, you know, centuries. So going into the connection between uh, Kalapuyans and this particular land, this Kalapuyan land, um, Steph continued to mark up the various panels that were part of this exhibition. And rather than read every detail of them, I am going to go through some of the Kalapuyan connections to this land. And then I've also got some belongings to show you with that. So the first thing to know about this land is that Kalapuyans engineered oak savannas through the Willamette Valley intentionally through careful burning and harvesting. They used controlled burns to regenerate the soil and clear brush. There are quite a few benefits that come from a controlled burn. Um, you know, the nutrients from the plants go back into the soil. The uh, path is cleared so it's easier to travel. Um, small brush and also, you know, Douglas firs that we have in this area are burnt out so that larger trees like oak trees can survive and get enough light without competition from Douglas firs. And it also reduces insects. And then, as we might be familiar with, you know, controlled burns can prevent the devastating wildfires that we've been experiencing in recent years. Um, by ensuring that there isn't, you know, an overabundance of, you know, uh, dry fuel on the ground. So controlled burns can be an important part uh, of environmental maintenance. The other piece of how Kalapuyan shaped the land is through harvesting. And a major food that Kalapuyans harvest is called camas. It has these beautiful purple flowers that bloom in the spring, April and May. And then underground, I'm gonna hold these up. It has 
let's see, can you see it here? These little bulbs, they look kind of like garlic bulbs. These are a couple dry ones. So imagine them um, perhaps a bit more fresh. <laughs> and these bulbs are a great source of uh, starch. So they've got a lot of, uh, they're a good energy source. And I've heard that when they're fresh, they taste a lot like um, garlic, but once they're cooked, you know, for several days in a pit oven, then they become uh, sweet, like caramelized onion. A tool here with me, this is called a cup and stick. That's K-U-P-I-N, cup and stick. And it is actually around three feet long. It is carved from wood. And then we've got an antler handle here. Oh, here's on my screen. And then you can see the antler has been inserted onto the top of the stick. And then at the end, it's got a point for digging into the ground. And so this cup and stick is used to dig up the camas bulbs underground. Today, Kalapuyans and other tribes who dig for camas um, use a metal cup and stick, but this is the traditional version. It would be about the right height for the person so they didn't have to bend over and hurt their back. So people would have their own individual stick that was the right uh, cup and stick for them. Kalapuyans um, were careful not to over harvest the camas. They'd make sure that they would leave enough that there would be, you know, fresh camas the next year so that it could grow uh, more and more. And it was actually recorded that the uh, plains of the Willamette Valley and the Tualatin Valley were said to look like a purple ocean in the spring. That's how much camas grew. Another plant we, man we mentioned is oak, the oak savanna um, that Kalapuyans created. It's actually a man-made habitat um, and the namesake of the museum, the Five Oaks Museum, which is named after a historic site that is near North Plains where Kalapuyans um, returned annually to harvest acorns and they would bury their heavy mortars and pestles at the site so they wouldn't have to carry them around. Uh, during the year. See. Speaking of moving around the Tualatin Valley, Kalapuyans spent the winter months in plank houses located around Lake Wapato, which is near present day Gaston. Um, and then would in other months travel to other parts of the valley to harvest camas, you know, harvest acorns, hunt, uh, go into the mountains, etc. But the center of the Tualatin Kalapuyan uh, villages was really Wapato Lake. And Wapato is this plant that looks somewhat like a potato. It's a tuber like a potato. I have got some of them here, sorry, not too good at holding this in front of the uh, computer camera. These are dried versions. So they're probably quite a few years old um, of what you can see on the uh, video screen. So they're not very large, but they're like little potatoes. And they have that big arrow uh, shaped leaf that you saw on the screen. And so these grow in shallow mud. They grew all around what's now Salvi Island, uh, along the Columbia River, and all around Lake Wapato. And so um, Kalapuyans would actually wade into the water and use their feet, their toes, to dislodge the tubers from the shallow mud. And then they would float up to the surface where it'd be easy to gather it. Today, there's actually um, restoration projects going on at Lake Wapato. Um, with the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the uh, US government as it's now, um, I believe owned by the US Fish and Wildlife uh, Department as it's a wildlife refuge today. And here's a picture of Lake Wapato. So you can see how green it is. This is a recent picture. It would have been 
more lake-like <laughs> historically, but it is going to be restored. But it's a very, you know, lush green part of the Tualatin Valley. Now, the other um, significant plant for Tualatin Kalapuyans that I'm going to talk about today is cedar. And the enormous old growth cedar, we've got this picture of the man in the tree <laughs> to show just how large the uh, ancient Western red cedar trees are. And the thing that's really special about cedar is that it has a really straight bark. And so I've got a piece of it here and Kalapuyans were able to peel off strips of this really straight bark. And underneath there's this other layer, I'm forgetting what it's called exactly, but it's another layer under the first bark that is also has really straight grains. You can see it's splitting really straight. Um, and then this is used for many, many things. So here I've got a basket that's been woven from cedar strips. You can see that these strips have been pulled apart and woven. This is cedar and bear grass. And so the cedar uh, is able to be soaked and made really flexible uh, with those straight grains. So you don't even have to cut down the tree to use the bark. And that bark can also be twisted into things like rope. This is a cedar rope here. And of course, then cedar is also used, the wood is used for boats. This is a Chinook style model of a boat. Sometimes I bring it to a school group and they think it's the real thing. I want to let you know it's a model. <laughs> Although I would love to see tiny people float in this. And then here we've got a plank house also built out of cedar. It's about 60 feet long, so three school buses. And this is a reconstructed plank house. This one is called Cathlopodal and it's located on the Ridgefield Wildlife Refuge, which is in Washington state, not too far from the Oregon border. And here you can see just how uh, large those planks of wood used for the plank house are. It's got a small entrance. Um, the walls are sort of sunken into the ground. And then on the inside, it looks something like this. This Plank house is set up to host visitors, but a plank house that Kalapuyans lived in, in the past might have had more partitions to have some more private living space. Um, I'm not too familiar with what their furniture looked like, but there would have been uh, beds and that sort of thing in there. And multiple families might live in a plank house since they're so large and, you know, intensive to build. Another thing I want to show you today is dentalium shells. These are about an inch or so long. They are hollow. They're almost look like tiny, tiny elephant tusks here. And these shells are actually currency for Kalapuyans and for other tribes of the Pacific Northwest. So the more uh, dentalium you'd have, the you know wealthier you would be. In the picture of the girl on the slide, um, you can see that this girl probably has quite a bit of wealth as she's got quite a bit of dentalium shells. And what is really notable about dentalium shells um, is that they grow in just one place. They grow on neutral north land which is on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. So that tells you um, that trading networks stretched that far up, that tribes would be trading various goods, you know, to Alton Kalapuyans would probably be trading camas um, for other goods, for fishing rights, for dentalium shells. 
And these are still prized for beading today. This, you can see there's also a contemporary piece of beadwork with dentalium shells in the picture. Now, this is probably the most well-known image of a Kalapuyan. It was drawn by an European explorer in the early 1800s. And we can see from this image that there's actually quite a bit of trade going on. This man is wearing an elk hide robe. He's carrying a bow and he's got a quiver to hold his arrows that is made out of seal skin. Now there's no seals in the Willamette Valley. So this tells us that he has traded with tribes on either the Columbia River or perhaps even the coast um, to get that seal skin. He is also wearing European style shoes. So you can tell that contact at this point has been ongoing um, and he's got those European style shoes on. Now, as we come to the end of talking about Kalapuyan lifeways, I wanted to bring us to this other artwork. Um, the artist Derek Lavore is Modoc from a, which is another Oregon tribe on the Oregon California border. And he actually currently lives in Beaverton. So just like before, I'm gonna start with looking at the artwork and seeing what do I notice. The first thing I see is that it's a skull. It's a skull that has been painted. It's painted green, pink, white, and it's got a black pattern. It's sort of got stripes that reminds me, honestly, of the colors of watermelon with those black dots on there. <laughs> um, this skull has also got feathers tied with leather through the eye sockets, almost like earrings. Um, it's missing the bottom uh, teeth part of the skull. And I can say from being informed by the artist here, I might not have known on my own, but this is in fact a cow skull. And then the thinking about it, the title of the artwork is SOS. Well, which is, you know, universal cry for help when you're in danger. So between the title and the skull, that's got me thinking about danger and death. And then I'm not sure about the colors though. So I'm gonna move on to reading the quote from the artist. He says, one side of my family relied on work from the farms and the other side are members of the Klamath tribes. I understand the agony of both sides over dam removal. Thinking about Klamath tribal lifeways and thinking about access to water, I'm realizing that the colors on this painted on the skull actually remind me of uh, trout and salmon which of course would be important to the Klamath tribe's lifeways. But then there's also the cow on the side of, you know, ranching, farming. There's a conflict over access to water there. And so he's saying he understands the agony of both sides, whether there's dams that provide enough water for the cattle or they're removed so that salmon are able to uh, go upstream and spawn. So I can see that today there's, um, you know, there's complexity to land, to uh, lifeways, to water, um, and conflicting interests, even as both are cultures that have these deep relationships with particular animals and with the land. All right, I'm gonna to start to move into the contact section. Contact is ongoing to this day. You know, indigenous people are still in contact in relationship uh, with settlers. And so when the 
European American, the white settlers come to Oregon, you know, as you may know, they're coming, start with fur trappers, then the Oregon Trail. And so they see the beautiful uh, fields of camas and they realize how rich the soil is and how excellent that would be for farming crops. And so quite a few people come uh, to settle in Oregon. And there's a time period in the 1840s where um, white settlers are able to grab land um, for free actually with the permission and the encouragement of the United States government through the Donation Land Claim Act. Um, but indigenous presence on the land hasn't been recognized officially at that point, even though they are living there. Um, and there's a sense that you know, indigenous folks are dying out because of diseases brought, but in fact, not everyone dies. And so the US government starts to, you know, have a conflict over what do we do with native folks who are on this land that the US wants for itself. So at first, agents try to negotiate treaties with the tribes and an initial treaty is negotiated with the Tualatin and Kalapuyans that gives them a reservation at Wapato Lake, the center of their homeland. But this original treaty was not ratified by Congress. So more uh, treaties end up being negotiated and eventually the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, signed by the Tualatin Kalapuyans and many other uh, Kalapuyan tribes, actually, they're sort of conglomerated at that, in the treaty, um, are sent to the Grand Ronde Reservation, which is on the Yamil River in the Yamil Valley. And in these treaties, um, the tribes are generally promised a certain amount of food, uh, medicine, supplies, um, protection from any angry settlers in exchange for peaceful removal to the reservation. And so Kalapuyans uh, do go peacefully. Some other tribes do resist um, and stand up for their right to remain on their land. And so here, Steph has taken a timeline that was part of the exhibition. And confusingly, it really had quite a bit of settler history on it. But she has added, with the help of scholar Dr. David G. Lewis, these white um, sort of notes onto the timeline to show indigenous and tribal history on here. So zooming in on them. It's probably not uh, close enough that you can read them anyway. But uh, the tribes are sent to Grand Ronde. They, you know, life on the reservation is really hard. They do form a um, constitution. They form a representative government. Um, and they are required to take up farming and not continue the traditional practices of uh, controlled burns. They're also required to, uh, through the school system, learn English and uh, stop practicing uh, their religions and their language and tr traditional uh, culture and so on. So, Louis Knoyer is actually the last known speaker of Tualt and Kalapuya. His father um, was born prior the reservation era, and then Louis was one of the children born on the reservation uh, in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. And so Louis actually ends up writing a book, so to speak. Um, of his childhood on the reservation in Tualatin and Kalapuya, and it is translated into English. So you can see here, uh, Tualatin and Kalapuya is not a written language, but this has been written with linguistic symbols to show uh, 
what Tualatin and Kalakuya sounded like. So if you were a linguist, you could read those symbols and speak Tualatin and Kalakuya. But this is an example of a typical lesson uh, at the reservation school. So you can see that there's quite a lot of learning English, there's repetition, and then there's also uh, Christianity brought in. So the tribes are being uh, missioned, missionaried. I don't think that's really a word. For the US government though, the on-reservation schools aren't assimilating the children fast enough. So they create off-reservation boarding schools. And the Forest Grove Indian Training School is actually the second uh, off-reservation boarding school created in the whole country. It was created in 1880 and ran until 1885 and then it moved to Salem where it continues to operate today, although under a different mission than in the 1880s uh, as Shamawa. Here, Steph has added family separation and uh, forced to leave, taken from their homes, forced to assimilate uh, onto this panel. At the schools, the children were taken from their families. They often weren't allowed to visit their families and they were required to cut their hair, wear Western style clothing, um, learn tasks and careers that were separated by gender, such as housekeeping and sewing and for women, and then carpentry and shoemaking uh, for the boys. This is a really well-known pair of photographs from the school of a group of Spokane students. Um, on the first day of school is the first uh, image on the left unless it's reversed on your screen. Um, and you hear there's, you can see that there's 11 children, they're wearing their clothes from home. And I think there's a variety of emotions on their faces. And then the next photograph is taken seven months later. These were meant to be promotional photographs for fundraising. So people were meant to see these photographs and say, oh, what a splendid job the school is doing. How wonderful. We'll send them some more money. In the second photograph, the children are wearing Western style clothes. Um, the boys are wearing military style clothing. And there are actually 10 students. Uh, one of the children in the original photograph has passed away from an illness. Um, in those seven months in between. Unfortunately, diseases were really rampant at these schools. And today there's a good number of burials that are known, but there are also many that are unknown. And so that is why there are federal investigations going on. You may have heard about this uh, starting in Canada and then more recently the US um, is going to look into uh, burials and sending kids finally back home. So today, through all of this, there was uh, the termination era when at some point after World War II, the government decided it wanted to eliminate expenses from the tribes and essentially take away Native American status, say, hey, they've assimilated. Uh, so it terminated the tribes, it took away tribal status and the designation of anyone as a Native American. And this had, you know, on top of the devastating effects of the reservation system, it had additional uh, effects. Many folks had to move to cities to get by. Um, there was a lot of loss of connection to culture, loss of connection to elders when there wasn't, you know, an official tribe to hold you together. Um, or to provide any services. So the tribes fought in court for um, restoration, which I have a photo of. It's up in the top corner of this uh, timeline image. And here the tribes uh, are going to court to get 
their tribal status back and Grand Ronde ends up being restored in 1983 and they are returned um, around 9,000 acres of the original reservation. So the reservation goes from 60,000 acres to 9,000 um, through this process. And I do want to note that let's see, uh, when tribes say the treaties are broken, this is a literal fact, you know. The original treaties that ceded land in exchange for the reservations, um, every one of them has been broken by the US government. But there's a, still a remaining question of now that that's happened, now what? You know, what are the tribes owed? What are the United States um, obligations there? So today the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde are a sovereign nation. They have the authority to govern themselves. They've got their own government, their own schools, healthcare, um, et cetera. Um, and that is how tribes are able to, uh, a lot of them do their funding through casinos because they're able to have them since they are technically not part of the United States. Uh, it's sort of a state within a state system. So actually a couple of years back, I always tell this story. I was driving over to the coast and I passed through Grand Ronde and I thought I'd stop to get gas. And I sat there in my car at the gas station and waited for the gas station attendant. And five minutes later, I was like, oh, no one's coming because I'm in a sovereign state. There, you, there, you can pump your own gas here. There's no gas station attendant. Grand Ronde has also been doing a lot to um, preserve culture, pass it on, and to uh, you know return to stewardship of the land. So this artwork is by Grand Ronde tribal member Carol Haskins. It's titled "Beaded Yoke," and Carol is a uh, teacher of beadwork and other cultural practices at Grand Ronde. So when I look at this artwork, I can see that it's the top part of a shirt. It's beaded all over. It's got blue and green beads. I often have people tell me, oh, it looks like Seahawks colors. And then in the center, it has got a set of diamonds. There's a big, big diamond that says Guam with a palm tree. Then there's smaller diamonds with a bird, maybe a quail, um, some flowers. I can't tell if they're in the shape of maybe islands or maybe a constellation. Um, and the center diamond's yellow with a mirror and some animal teeth. And then on the sides, I know you can't really see it very well in this picture, but there are uh, big bear paws up on the sides of the beaded yoke. I imagine, um, thinking about it, that this probably took hours to make. Can you imagine threading all the tiny beads um, onto a needle to make this? So I know that there's definitely a lot of dedication that must have gone into this. I really wonder about why it says Guam, uh, since Carol's from Grand Ronde. And then when I'm looking, oh, here is a picture of the back. So there's more uh, beadwork on the back, more diamonds. And there's also a little bear. So Carol says, teaching beadwork in native community creates a sense of family, carrying on the connections like the ancestors did. I can see you know, maybe a relationship between these diamond patches. Um, I wonder if they're maybe made by different people and who are part of the family. Something about Carol is that um, her daughter is also in the exhibition and has a very different style of artwork, but there's a sort of carrying on of creativity and uh, cultural expression, even in a different style. And then I did actually get a chance to speak to Carol and ask her about why it says Guam uh, on the beaded yoke. And she shared that actually that her father is from Grand Ronde and he served in the military. 
And when he served, he was stationed in Guam, where he met Carol's mother. So Carol is a uh, Grand Ronde and Guamanian. There's certain parallels, of course, to Guam uh, as a territory that's occupied by the U.S. and where the indigenous people of Guam uh, don't have, uh, they actually don't have sovereignty over their own uh, land. And so Carol has made this uh, in honor of her mother, which I guess is carrying on uh, those sense of family connections. So coming to the end here, I wanted to leave you with the term survivance. It's the idea of survival and more, you know, survival and perseverance and resistance. Um, at this point, indigenous people aren't just surviving contact. They are carrying on their culture. They are getting involved in caretaking of the land. Um, and they are, you know, asserting their sovereignty. So I think that I do want to make sure I get sound for this video. So I think I'm going to stop and restart my screen share so that I can make sure to click the button that allows you to have sound. All right, so I'm going to stop the screen share and I'll be right back with it in a moment. All right, I'm hoping that you all should have sound this time. When I All right, it doesn't have sound again. Let me try it um, with myself not on mute. We tried tr uh, troubleshooting a couple sound things before this started. But if it doesn't when I view time. the falls and when I uh, step my foot on the boat that goes up to see the falls at a greater perspective, to feel the, the strength and to hear the voices of my ancestors there is truly overwhelming knowing that our families um, from time immemorial essentially used those areas and fished and lived here and gathered the salmon and the, and the steelhead through the dip netting and then the other net methods of netting. It's, it's just cool to see that we're able to do that again. And uh, it's very, very special to me. I myself was very fortunate to be on one of the fishing parties uh, that went out and got scuffled got eels for the first time in many, many years as part of a, a grandma fishing party. And that was one of the most exciting, rewarding, amazing cultural experiences. It was just the experience of a lifetime. In 1954, my mom was a part of the Relocation Act. And um, the experience that she had with that I can just imagine that the similarity for our ancestors and for us today to be able to reconnect back to the Wam Falls, it feels like you belong. And I think that's carried from our ancestors. It was so exciting when our little preschoolers, we called them the little wolves, and the day that they brought in a poster, they cut out their little faces and showed them standing on the platform fishing for salmon. It brings it all full circle. They're going to be the ones who 20 years, 30, 40, 50, whatever it takes, the time it takes, 
that will be the ones that will say, yeah, I remember when. That was my picture, and I'm doing that today. And my kids and my grandkids are doing that too. Watching that video, you know, I really, it's moving to see the tribe be able to reclaim the Willamette Falls. Um, the tribe, I think, it, probably about two years ago, purchased the paper mill site that is, includes the land around the Willamette Falls, which are in present day Oregon City. And they are doing a whole environmental restoration project um, and are going to eventually be able to open it up to the public um, and have folks come in and visit. There will be cultural materials as well as you know gathering places. And it's really exciting to be able to see the tribe, t uh, you know, purchasing land back. There's a movement going on right now called Land Back, um, which has various interpretations, but essentially for indigenous people to be able to, uh, you know, exercise their relationship and responsibilities uh, with their tribal lands that, you know, their tribes and their community have cared for and been in relationship with for centuries. And so we're starting to see this uh, really, this movement really grow. And it, it gives me a lot of hope, you know, there's a lot of fear about the future with climate change and, you know, all of the challenges we're facing. And there's a bit of hope for me to know that Indigenous people, they have generational knowledge, they have cultural knowledge, and they have uh, relationships with particular lands, and that they know how to best care for them so that things can be sustained. And so it gives me hope to see uh, more of uh, you know, more indigenous voices being listened to and more land being uh, given back or at least partially stewarded like Lake Wapato is today. So we are coming to the end of our program tonight. You are welcome to ask me questions, anything you'd like in the chat, um, as well as I'd like to suggest some further learning if you'd like to keep going from here. Um, some suggested books. I mentioned the book My Life by Louis Knoyer, who was the last known speaker of Tualatin and Kalapuya. Um, his book is really, really fascinating. It's completely bilingual, Tualatin and Kalapuya and English. And there's also a lengthy introduction about the history of the tribe. There's also the Chinook Wawa Dictionary, um, which is a shared language between multiple tribes that uh, is spoken at Grand Ronde. And then there's a young adult book called Indian No More, which is about uh, a Grand Ronde tribal member's uh, experience during termination. And yeah, like I said, this is a young adult fictional book. And then in terms of places to visit, uh, definitely check and see what is going on with the pandemic. Uh, I'm not sure if all these places are open, um, but keep them on your radar for the future. There's Chichalu Museum at Grand Ronde, Kamasia Nature Preserve in West Lynn that has beautiful blooms of camas in the spring, the Tualatin River Wildlife Refuge in Sherwood, um, the Kathlapoto Plank House, which we mentioned. And then I've also got some folks on Instagram that I would recommend. Uh, Steph, of course, the curator of this exhibition, uh, Amber Starks, who has a lot of sort of uh political and identity posts and then the international indigenous youth council is sort of a general type of posting um this is kalapuyan land is an online exhibition on the five oaks museum website you can see the full exhibition there you can read all the panels and see all the artwork um, and i would definitely recommend checking it out Thank you so much everyone for coming to this program tonight.
I will stay on for a little bit in case anyone has additional questions, but I, I'm just really glad that you all have come out and are interested in learning about the indigenous people of this area. And uh, hopefully this is just the start for you. Victoria, thank you so much for um, uh, being here this evening and, and sharing the, the exhibit that uh, Five Oaks uh, has made available to the communities. Uh, I invite everyone, please, if you have questions or comments, post those now and we can get to them. Um, while we're waiting, um, I, I, I was struck during your presentation, one of the themes that really comes through um, for me is reclamation, not only in terms of the land as you talk about, but also in terms of Steph's involvement with this exhibit and how through her act of reclaiming her history, the exhibit became something very different than it had been when it was originally uh, uh, put up. Can you talk a little bit about that uh, relationship? Absolutely. You know, I think that reclamation is a really strong theme. Imagine if Steph had seen those old panels that the museum had put together and been like, oh, that doesn't represent my tribe, throw them away. And, you know, it would have been perfectly justified for her to say that. But instead, she chose to reclaim them and to write on them so that we could see both perspectives right there on the panels. Mm -hmm. And that, that act of um, making those changes uh, is, uh, uh, I think, a very uh, powerful act of reclamation, right? It's a very visible act of reclamation. Um, we have a question from Franca who asks, um, what do you have to add about the relationship with the Kalapuya and the French Indian families who farm Shampui? You know, I am not quite sure what the French Indian families are referring to. I'm imagining maybe French Canadian Metis people who are mixed. Um, so I honestly don't have a lot to add about that. I think that that would be a great question to look more into. Um, I do know that the I associate Shampooey somewhat with the Jason Lee Methodist mission. So there uh, was part of the, you know, at times uh, well-intentioned and at times uh, purely a sort of racist uh, element of uh, conversion of native folks to Christianity, whether that was the Methodists or um, the Catholics at Grand Ronde. So there's definitely a relationship between religion and, uh, you know, power and land there, but I'm not too familiar with that particular relationship. Franca, if you have uh, anything more that you can add, uh, please post that. Maybe we can uh, follow up with that. Um, Victoria, we were talking before we went on about um, how you have an invitation to do a, a presentation for some school kids uh, uh, coming up. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how the history that you're presenting, um, how students react to seeing this representation. What are, what are some of the, the ways that you're seeing that this is changing how they think about themselves and about who they are? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that because uh, student groups are one of our main audiences for this exhibition. And actually with the passing of Senate Bill 13, Tribal History, Shared History, a lot of educators are now really excited to bring this as Kalapuyan land into their classrooms because they have uh, sort of that state backing, that state requirement to include indigenous education in the classroom. and. You know, students have a really strong sense of justice. Young people have a really strong sense of justice. And it's exciting to see them uh, go through the exhibition and 
they come away with, I think, a sort of an urge to do something. And they come away with an awareness that, you know, many students might be going into learning about this exhibition with certain stereotypes in mind, um, since they haven't necessarily been exposed to a lot of Indigenous education before. And so we can really see that by looking at the specific exhibition that the stereotypes, they go right out the door in the first like two minutes and students are able to be a lot more uh, open to having conversations. They're really interested in conversations of what do we do now and what would be the right thing to do now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you talk um, at all with students about the process that uh, Steph engaged with in reclaiming this um, oh, yeah. part of their history? Yeah, the uh, museum actually has learning activities that are available to download on our website. They're offered on a sliding scale and they go through uh, five sections. We start with an introduction about the changes Steph made and then we go through uh, tribes and languages, uh, Kalapuyan lifeways, broken treaties, and then we actually spend a whole section on family separation. And so really young people, elementary students as young as third graders are getting a lot of the same content that we share with adults. We just share with it in you know an age appropriate way. Mm -hmm. um, but they're interested and able to learn about these things, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the process of how Steph edited the exhibitions, I think, resonates with a lot of students because they're familiar with the process of writing something and their teacher remarks on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She did comment uh, in her uh, Medium post about how uh, what she did was almost like taking out the red pencil or red crayon and correcting, uh, which I think is a is a very powerful image uh, and, a, and an interesting shift in power. <laughs> Um, Franca, actually, thank you for, for following up. So the source that Franca um, mentioned uh, for her question about the um, French Indian families who farmed in Shampui is a book by um, Marie Melinda Jeté. Um, it was published by the Oregon State University Press called The French Indian Community in 19th Century Oregon, 1812 to 1859. Um, and I'm just scanning the uh, description here uh, and she in the description she talks about um, she says by establishing farming and husbandry operations in the valley the French Indian settlers enhanced the Willamette Valley's appeal as a destination of choice for the Anglo-Americans who later immigrated to the Pacific Northwest via the Oregon Trail. So it'd be an interesting um, source to follow up on. Um, yeah absolutely I would definitely like to check that out. Hearing that description just reminds me of how the Kalapudian land stewardship of the Willamette Valley, creating those oak savannas full of camas with and rich soil for farming also is part of attracting uh, Oregon Trail settlers, although not intentionally. <laughs> we, uh, we've chatted before and I'm, I'm hoping you can uh, just share with our viewers um, what are the plans for the museum um, in the near future as far as opening to the public or um, continuing to provide uh, virtual access to exhibits? I know it's the hot topic of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the museum has, uh, its building has been closed um, since 2020, but we are very much open and live uh, on our museum website and social media. And we also have a monthly newsletter that I would really recommend for uh, keeping track of our updates and seeing places that you can see uh, the museum exhibitions in the community, such as that this is Kalapuyan Land Yard Signs. There's also a reproduction of the exhibition that is up at Hidden Creek Community Center, I believe it's called, in Hillsboro mm -hmm. right now. And it sh is up until at least the end of the month. Um, in terms of the museum itself being open to the public, 
we are still very tentative about that. Um, we do have to follow Portland Community College's guidelines since we're on their campus. Um, so we are hoping that we should be able to put together a physical exhibition for fall, um, but we will have to keep you all posted on that. In the meantime, definitely check us out online. Well, we are so excited about um, initiating these collaborations. As I mentioned at the beginning of our program, we've got some um, some ideas in the pipeline for uh, the spring and uh, and after. So um, please stay tuned for those. And uh, by all means, check out what's happening at Five Oaks. Uh, they are a remarkable organization, and uh, and they they truly uh, exemplify their values. Um, and I think um, as a, an organization in the community, uh, they are uh, amazing stewards of this history, and uh, we're we're just so pleased to be working with them and to be uh, establishing this connection. So uh, Victoria, thank you so much for uh, taking time out this evening to uh, talk to us about this is Kalapuyan land. And um, we look forward to uh, working with you in 2022. Thank you so and, much, Bob. And, and thank, thank you everyone you, for your time yeah. tonight. And thank you everyone um, for uh, joining us tonight. Be sure to uh, come back again in February, February 8th for Tyler Stewart and February 15th for Dr. Dr. Donna Sinclair's uh, talk on Gloria Brown. And uh, uh, we look forward to offering these programs more throughout the year. So stay tuned. Stop by our uh, Facebook page, visit our website, and uh, we'll be in touch. So until next time, good evening, everybody. Be safe, and we'll see you around. Take care.